This is the CR6 Max, Creality's larger build volume cousin to the CR6 SE. This is the kind of machine you should get. What makes this machine so special? What's up with those stories about the SE? And won't this just be the same thing? Who the heck am I? And why should you listen to me? What's underneath that sheet behind me? Talk all about that right now. Welcome to my channel. I'm Chris. I'm a filmmaker who likes to 3D print. And wait, are you just a 3D printing hobbyist? Well, no, not really. I consider myself more of a 3D printing consumer. Just like I don't work on my car for fun, but I need to know how it operates enough to maintain and take care of it so that I can make use of what it does. <gasps> what that means is that there are probably other channels that will have a far greater technical understanding of these machines. I represent the eventual goal of any technology to reach the hands of consumers who wish to use the product more casually or to supplement other areas of expertise. Uh, it's the early adopter hobbies that really fuel the technology to reach that point, much like VR. With that in mind, I hope to bring a viewpoint closer to an average consumer when it comes to evaluating if this printer seems like a good product or not. The full extent of this explanation goes outside of the scope of this video, so if you'd like me to dedicate a video explaining my thoughts on what this means and what my particular viewpoint brings to the table, please leave a comment as I'd love to hear if you'd be interested in that. If enough people seem interested in that video, I'll end up putting a link to that video here and in the description. In the meantime, on with the review. The CR6 Max has a 400 millimeter cubed build volume. For us Americans, that's almost 15 and 3 quarter inches in length, width, and height. That's huge! For comparison, here's my very first printer, the Flash Forge Finder. It's an absolute workhorse, but its entire build frame is just 5 millimeters shy of fitting in this build volume. The frame is a sturdy aluminum with pull rods for extra stability since the build volume is so large. And assembly was overall very easy, having never assembled a printer before. And I unboxed it live, and if you'd like to see that assembly, it'll be here. It uses a Bowden extruder, so the motor pushing the filament is here and feeds through the PTFE tube into the hot end here. The hot end reaches 260 degrees Celsius, and the build plate, which is glass with a coating book, reality is hauling carborundum reaches up to 90 degrees Celsius. You can easily remove the plate with these knobs here. The nozzle model is classified as MK, but is compatible with Mark 8 nozzles. So if you need different kinds, like this one millimeter or this steel 0.6 millimeter nozzle, which is perfect for abrasive filament, uh, you can do it there that way. And when I spoke to someone at Creality, they explained that the MK is essentially the second generation of the Mark 8 nozzle. They claim that the details as to the improvements to the nozzle involve company secrets and as such can't reveal all the details. Now the bed leveling is completely automated. There are no adjustment knobs like most printers use and the bed leveling sensor uses an interesting strain gauge system which gives when pressed against the bed. It has a sensor to detect the movement that results. The control interface is a 4.3 inch color touch screen that is thankfully very responsive and will display a very odd thermal runaway protection notification if something goes wrong with the temperature on the hot end. The Z uses dual motors while the Y motor operates dual belts and both the Y and X belts come with tensioner knobs built in making it a snap to adjust. Meanwhile, over on the extruder you have a photoelectric run-up detection system. Essentially, it's like the light on your garage to prevent the door from closing when someone's in the way, but in reverse. As long as the light sees the filament, everything's good. Additionally, the firmware has power loss protection by being able to resume the print after power loss. I have a caveat to that I'll mention later. To finish up the tour of the machine, the notable elements are the silent motherboard and drivers. I thought my finder was quiet until I ran this machine. 
a meanwhile power supply, which automatically adjusts the power format to your country, no switch, this swinging side arm, which will hold your filament spool, silicon strain relief for the heating wires for the bed, a data input by way of micro USB and SD memory slot, and finally, this handy dandy tool drawer. It's a small thing, but it's neat. Now, the device is rated to be able to print PLA, PETG, TPU, and wood filaments. I can confirm personally on all but the wood, as I had none to try. Now, I've seen some on the forums use the SE for more temperamental filaments like ABS, and the 3D printing nerd confirmed that the SE could print them, but the as is, he was unable to get it to stick to the build plate. I think part of what others did was using closures around the machine to help control and raise the ambient temperature that but that's just my guess. The plate and hot end can get hot enough to print ABS by rating, but approach at your own risk. All right, that's the basics out of the way. Now, the first two years of my 3D printing experience was with the Finder. And as such, I was keenly aware of certain things missing from the CR6 Max that I got used to with the Finder that others may not, but let's start with what I feel is missing. Wi-Fi. This is a convenience thing, and I rarely use it myself except to update the firmware, which was a breeze, but there are some that find it an essential tool for more efficient workflow. Folder management. The CR6 Max cannot navigate folders on your SD card, which means unless your files are in the root folder, the machine cannot see them. For comparison, this is how the Finder navigates. This is one of the features I use the most, so I was really confused when I first tried using the printer on screen. Internal memory. Hand in hand with folder management, other than the firmware itself, the CR6 Max has zero internal memory to hold prints or even keep track of the status of its prints for the power loss prevention system and instead relies on the SD card to store that memory. This includes leveling information, which I feel is an oversight not to even have a simple memory chip to store these two vital pieces of information. By comparison, I can take a memory stick over to the finder, copy it over to the internal memory, Get to printing, take out the stick, do whatever else would I want in the meantime. Estimated completion time. This one I feel is very important when printing as I would play my schedule around the completion of the prints, and sometimes it can be bothersome to attempt to try and remember how long the slicer said it might take to print. Subtract the total from the print time so far to find out the alleged uh, time remaining. I feel like a simple firmware update could fix this though, so I suppose time will tell. Too bad you can't Wi-Fi an update. As of the recording of this video, there are no CR6 Max specific accessories. Now, while the SE has options like the PEI flexible build plates and whatnot, I'm waiting to see accessories. While I have enjoyed this plate, having the option of a flexible magnetic PEI sheet would be really nice. Not to mention, the second generation MK nozzles aren't available in other sizes or materials yet, so if you want that, you have to go with the Mark 8 nozzles. No handle. Yeah, I know this thing is a beast, so it makes sense not to have one, and its clearance is already tall enough. But I was kind of excited by the SD having one, and to be honest, having a dedicated handle when I'm moving the thing around would have been very helpful, so I'm not grabbing the timing belt. Final missing item. It's not available for retail purchase yet. So last I spoke to someone at Creality, the goal was at least January, but that's obviously not happened. I saw a posting uh, for it on the website Banggood, but I'm not sure if it's legit. Here's why. I was a backer on the Kickstarter, so I got it for $6.99 US. The retail is supposed to be for $7.99, and the posting has it listed for $8.69. So I think someone is reselling them. Once this changes or I get an update, I'll leave a link in the description as well as pin a comment. So now that's all my personal preferences. Make of that what you will, but let's move on to the problems I've had with this machine. Let's start with the filament first interacts. There is a gap between the sensor and the extruder. The filament tip is often slightly curved, so it won't make the gap without reaching in between to give it guidance, which is really difficult, and I have smaller hands than most males. Now, there are 3D printed files that will easily fix this issue, but it seems like a needless oversight. Now, right next to that is the extruder itself. Almost every time, I've had to twist the filament at least 90 degrees as I push it through the extruder to get it to go through. The only filament I never needed to do this with was certain TPUs due to their flexibility. I'm no engineer, so I'm not sure about a fix to this, and it seems it's a minor annoyance, but 
Again, I feel it's an obvious oversight. Now the cable setup is a bit awkward. So, cause they sag, but it's not enough to really worry. And it's not enough to touch the build plate. Personally, I plan to add one of those retractable keychains between the top and the cables to keep them up. This hasn't provided to be a series problem, but something to keep your eye on. So folks on the forums noticed that the wheels gave off gunk in the first few weeks of running their machines. But after that, didn't produce any more. Which says to me that there came with uh, some sort of coating which had to be worn off, but had a finite thickness, and afterwards had no effect on the operation of the system. Just uh, annoying to clean up. A little more serious, but I noticed the right Y belt on my machine was rubbing on the outside while printing, and I needed to open up the cover for the gear and slide it back to align it back. If I hadn't noticed this, I could have had a snapped belt. Uh, and you can see the slight damage that's already been done while it was misaligned. This may not be with every machine, but keep your eyes on the moving parts when you operate a new machine to make sure they seem to be operating as intended. Now around the same time, I also recorded an odd noise with my Y motor that it was making, but and then it randomly stopped and never heard from it again. Here, take a listen. Not sure what happened, but if it had persisted, I would have needed customer support. Which brings me to customer support response time. Now, I'm sure they were very overwhelmed, but trying to get a hold of someone at Creality for, to answer simple questions, much less technical support issue, was trying at best. I will say they are getting better, and Naomi Wu, tech extraordinaire, who worked with them to launch her version of a belt mill printer, was a force of nature getting Creality to help customers with their broken SE machines. And I'm hoping they learn from this experience with the Kickstarter issues and have beefed up their customer support because that would be the smart move. So the weird part about the strain gauge is that the nozzle easily moves when there's a bump or glob of plastic in the print. The main problem is that with a stiff nozzle, it'll just ignore and tear straight through it. I watched it happen with the finder. Uh, when you have a flexible hot end like this, and it meets a bump, it exacerbates the bump into a second layer and a third and so on until the bump gets even bigger and eventually the nozzle bumps around and completely screws up and causes lots of layer issues and become a runaway problem. Most of the time, this has never been an issue, but if you're trying to experiment with the limits of your printer's ability to create unique printing geometry, this can become a real problem and a consistent issue. Okay, so here's the caveat to the power restart feature. The one time I used it, it was due to a bump in the of the entire printer and table and it started making some very worrying noises. So I just shut it off. When I restarted it, it got the Z location wrong and was digging into already extruded layers, essentially ruining the entire print. I know many have tested the system and it worked just fine, but there may be mechanical extenuating circumstances that may cause the restart to fail. So keep an eye on it when you restart to make sure it picks up in the right place. Along the lines with firmware, the file name display doesn't have a lot of room for a descriptive file name. Instead of making room on a second line though, it decides for the more lazy ellipses coding method. This is more of a nitpick, but when I have a lot of iterations of the same print and I'm testing them, it's good to be able to differentiate between them. Now, I will say some folks on the forums pointed out that the carborundum layer would peel off when removing prints. I never ran into that particular issue at all. I suspect that temperature could play a role in that, as prints stuck incredibly well to the surface when heated, but were almost completely unstuck from the plate once it cooled down to room temperature. I suggest just being careful when removing the prints and don't be impatient. Let it cool down. Now, something to keep in mind uh, when reading over various spec sheets is the bed temperature. The SE is marked at 110, but the spec sheets on the Kickstarter page of the Max said that we would get a 100 degree bed, but we only ended up getting 90 which is correctly listed on the Creality website. So you may get confused depending on where you look. The Creality site is the most accurate spec sheet. Now, I suppose the last problem is more like a humble brag, but the loudest part of this machine is the cooling fan on the Meanwell power supply. This is an easy upgrade for anyone who wants true near silent printing, but the fan doesn't always run either, so it's partially a moot point. All right, so that's the bad news. Having said that, here are my remaining thoughts on this printer. 
I wanted to get a real thorough understanding of what this machine's abilities were, so I printed a lot. Now I have to say, it gets great prints right out of the box. Just look here. Woo! These are nearly all the prints I've made so far. This is the Benchy that I started printing live on stream. It was included on the card that came with the Mac, and it turns out to be a 200% size Benchy. The layers look beautiful, and I don't know if it was the double size or the pre-sliced slicer path choice to go over the loop like this, but it wasn't the best and created a bit of overhang droop. But other than that, it's beautiful. All right, so check out this piece. This is from a file that I bought uh, from an artist that made it, and the details on it are absolutely amazing. This is pretty much just kind of like an as is, almost no tweaking at like 375% size, I think. But I mean, as you can see, this is just, this is a beast. This is a hand cannon. Details are amazing. No real stringing to speak of. It was, I was very impressed by it. These are TPU. So both the A95 and the A89 TPU printed beautifully with little to no stringing. Look at that. I know, they, I know they say no retractions with TPU, but I was even able to use retractions. Now to clarify, the 95 and 89 ratings are how flexible it is. The lower the number, the more squishy it gets. Now I use Cura 4.8 for all my splicing, which was my first time using a splicer outside the Flashboards ecosystem. At the time, there was only a Steer 6 SE profile available, which worked out perfectly for my needs as I only needed to change the build plate to match the size of the Max. Also, mine came with a one kilo of PLA, but I've heard tell that the full 1K was only for the backers and that the retail purchasers of the SE got a smaller spool. It's not a big deal uh, if they do that with the Max as mine got soggy before I finished it anyway. So the question remains, do I think this is a good 3D printer? Yes. No printer is perfect, and even with every problem I noted, none were so bad that got in the way of consistent performance and excellent prints. I would go so far as to say that if you're a noob to 3D printing and want a huge printer or a professional looking to add to your toolkit, like say, a prop maker, I would recommend the CR6 Max. Now here's a note for those I've seen asking if the Max has the same problems as the SE did when the backer version came out. That's a big emphatic no. I already covered some of it, but obviously no power supply wattage issue to worry about since this one does it automatically. The power switch issue on the SE is not an issue here as the wiring and switch model and whatnot are totally different with this machine. Just sad because I bought a green light up one just in case and I never got to use it. Now mine didn't and I haven't heard of any Max users board smoking, so that's not an issue. And while I haven't used the USB port, I asked other Max users who did, and they say that it rates the normal 5 volts instead of the 24 volts some were getting from the SE, causing it to spark. So I'm guessing while quality control for the SE during initial production varied wildly, Fidelity seems to have locked down a lot of variants by the time they started manufacturing the Max. Honestly, I think Creality had a rough start with the Kickstarter, and while they made plenty of mistakes and made a good number of people understandably upset, they seem to have their heart in the right place to try and make the, make it right and appear to be learning from their mistakes to become a better company. Maybe I'm an optimist, but I'd like to think they're going to continue to do better. All right, that's the CR6 Max review in the can. Uh, this is my first review for a 3D printer, so please let me know how I did in the comments below. Was I too verbose? Did I miss something? Was it at all helpful? I'd love to know what you think and how I can do better for you. In the meantime, I'm thinking to cover some of the individual prints I'm working on in dedicated videos as I've learned some things that I'd like to share with y'all. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like and subscribe if you're interested in hearing more about these prints. I have a plan to ramp up some more content on here now that I've done a lot of the prep work. Uh, and if you're interested to know more about some of the things I do, like other channels I run, please check that out in the uh, doobly-doo below. Anyway, Thank you all for watching. I'm looking forward to seeing you all again.